In the conversion process, there must be a change of one's heart. Because without that change of heart, there is no change of the very person. There is no conversion. I remember many, many years ago after Vietnam fell and we were working with the Vietnamese who had been brought into one of three places in the United States. That was at Fort Chappie by Fort Smith, Arkansas. I taught a Bible class for about five months every day out there. And there was a fellow who came and began to show up regularly and came consistently. We began to visit. He had been, I believe, uh, a major in the Vietnamese Army and a uh, very humble man. In the process of time, he came and requested to be baptized. Well, you have to jump through all sorts of hoops to get them out of their particular area. and There were only 50,000 of them out there, so, so we had to reserve the swimming pool. So that had to be done on a different day, so we got it all together and picked him up in a jeep and took him from the barracks over to the swimming pool, and there we baptized him. Well, when we came back, all of his family was out on the little porch, all of them just looking. And uh, he leaned over to me and he says, they want to see if I look any different now that I've been baptized. <laughs> well, I thought about that a lot of times. While our physical appearance may not change except from dry to wet, there's been a big change in the conversion because the heart has been changed. Now, I have to understand then what we mean by the heart because one of the marks of the Lord's church is that a change of heart is indispensable when it comes to becoming a Christian. You can believe in Christ. You can confess Christ to be the Son of God. And you can be baptized in water for the remission of sins. But if you have not repented, if there has not been a change of heart, then you just got wet. You're still in your sins. You're not converted. Conversion means to have a change of heart and even a change of state. Your whole disposition of life changes and it starts on the inside, as we say the heart, and it comes to the outside. There's a difference in everything about you, thoughts, words, and actions. So when we speak of the heart, we're not talking about that muscle that moves the blood around your body. But we're talking about what we would say is the inward man, the spirit that God fathered when you physically were conceived. I think we would do well to remember that every time the procreative act takes place between a man and a woman, God creates a spirit that will always exist. That's the power God's put into your hands. Every human being, aside from Adam and Eve, have come into this world through a procreative act. Even the Son of God born of the Virgin Mary, there was the procreative act of the divine third person of the Godhead working through the natural way that a person is conceived and born to come into this world. John said in John 1, 14, and the word was made flesh. We beheld him, and uh, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So it's important as a side thought to realize that, but now I'm speaking of spiritual conversion that's evidenced in the way you think and what you say and don't say and what you do and don't do. Jesus, in describing the heart and showing it wasn't the blood pump, in Matthew 15, 19, said, For out of the heart, out of the heart, come forth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, railings. All those things, those actions began as thoughts of the heart. So these heinous sins then are first committed in the inward man, in the heart, in the mind of man. That has to be changed. 
to be converted to Christ, that all has to be taken care of. So we need to realize then about the heart. We do understand that when you do damage to the heart, that you can be killed. We find that uh, when Absalom died, the scripture records in 2 Samuel 18, 14, he took three darts in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom. Well, of course, he wasn't talking about the inward man or the mind of man. Yet, when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 16, he said, But though our outward man perisheth, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. So I like to refer to our spirits, fathered by God, as the real you and the real me that will continue to exist as a center of personality, a person after our bodies have returned to dust. You'll find, therefore, that on the day the church of our Lord started in Jerusalem on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, that when the apostles stood up to preach, that it said of those who heard and believed the gospel message, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And they cried out unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Of course, the answer is given to believers, for that's what they were when they asked this, in verse 38, when he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises unto you and to your children and all them that are far off even as many as the Lord our God shall call so we see then that it is the gospel message it pricks the inward man we'll understand more about that in a moment remember the gospel must be preached to every creature does this help you understand why the gospel is the glad tidings of Jesus Christ 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4 the gospel is where God has located his power to save you from sin. Romans 1.16. Now that tells us why Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation. So we need to understand that. So we're not speaking of the muscle that pumps the blood around our bodies. We're speaking of the inward man, the real you, the spirit that is within you that will continue on and on after this body returns to the dust from which it was made. So let's look at the heart a little closer, the inward man, the real you. I learned that the heart is that part of man that is called intellect. Intellect. It is our processor. It's our place of gaining information about things. Our mind Mind many times can be used synonymously with spirit. For the evolutionist who says that man is the product of organic evolution, there is no God and through multiplied in billions of years of evolution, chance, accidental evolution, then he evolved what he is. And all they can do is say that uh, man's matter in motion. And all they can do is say basically when he thinks that that's just one atom running into another atom and something happens. But we're not talking about that. The thinking is done in the mind of man. When Abraham speaks to the rich man who's pictured as a lost person being tormented in Luke 16 in the area known as torment in that part of the Hadean world, he says to him, a spirit speaking to a spirit, no matter, no flesh, he said, son, remember. There's no brain there to work. It's left back here on earth. So he says, son, remember, when people stand before Jesus in judgment, they'll be able to account for everything they did and said while they were in their bodies, but they will not be in the physical body at that time. So when we think of the component parts of the inward man, the heart, then we think one of them is intellect. How do I know that's the case? Well, I read in Matthew 9, 4, Jesus said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts. And then I read in Mark 2, 8, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? And in Matthew 13, 15, He said, Understand with their 
hearts. In the Romans 10 and verse 10, Paul talks about with the heart man believeth. So I know the intellectual, rational part of man is in that spirit that God created. The heart. That's what I mean in that first component part when it comes to the matter of a man's thinking. I also learned that the heart is seen to be that attribute of man called emotion. In 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 16, I learned that the heart can despise. The scripture says she despised him in her heart. I learn also from Paul's writings in Romans 10 and verse number 1 that the heart can desire. Brethren, Paul says, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Then I read too in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37 concerning the ultimate full love that we ought to have toward God. Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Then I see too that uh, the heart trusts, has confidence in others. And I read in Proverbs 3, 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. So there's a second component part of the real you, your spirit, that makes you a person that will continue to exist after this body no longer does. So what God calls the heart, man may call emotions, but it also involves then the intellect and the rational powers that we possess. I also learned that the heart is that quality of man called will. We sometimes call it free moral agency. I read in 1 Corinthians 7, 37, that they had determined this in their heart. Where was the determining done? Where was the willing done? It was done in their heart, 1 Corinthians 7, 37. That I can intend to do this and so or not in the heart, the thoughts and intents of the heart, Hebrews 4, 12. And that passage is talking about the power and the sharpness of the word of God to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. In Acts 11 and 23, we learn that the heart purposes that which, uh, that with purpose of heart, they would cleave to the Lord. That ought to tell us something about our determination to keep on doing what is right as the Bible defines the right, let come what may. We have to purpose so to do. And then I learn in Romans 6, 17, as Paul's writing about what the Romans did in becoming Christians when they obeyed the gospel, he said, ye obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, Romans 6, 17. So I can learn then from the scriptures by a proper division of the word, 2 Timothy 2, 15, that the heart determines, it intends, it purposes, and from it we are led to obedience. There must be a disposition of submission and obedience in the heart. The heart is that faculty of man also, and this is the last one of the component parts when put together makes the inward man of the heart, the real you, is the faculty of man that's called conscience. Conscience. The conscience either condones what you do or it condemns what you do. I think it's important to understand that it stands apart from the other three component parts of the inward man. We learn the standard of conduct in our intellects and we rationally use those principles to determine what we do and by our will we do or we don't do them. Notice 1 John 3, 20 and 21. If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our hearts condemn us not, we have boldness toward God. So the Bible is speaking of a part of man which 
condemns or approves, but it does it on the basis of the standard that's in the intellect. So when we speak of the conscience, it's the highest court of your being. But all it can do is say, feel very good because you've done what you believe the standard of right and wrong says you ought to do. Feel very bad for you violated the standard that you believe to be the ultimate standard of moral and spiritual guidance. So it's all dependent upon the intellect being educated with the right standard. If you are a Muslim and follow after the Quran and their other holy books, you're going to have a standard that makes your conscience say, well, just feel very good about that. When those governed by the Bible are going to say, that's just as wrong as it can be. And it's going to bother the Muslim when he violates whatever his standard is. Same thing's true of the Hindu. Same thing's true of a Jew who does not believe in the New Testament or that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Messiah, the Son of God. Paul even made it clear that he thought he did God's service when he was Saul the persecutor and persecuting the church. And yet later on he said, I lived in all good conscience before God in this day. How could he do that while persecuting the church? Because he thought he was abiding by God's standard and fighting a false Christ. That's exactly what he thought. But you will note this, he did not violate his conscience. That's very important that a person not violate his conscience. He's got to be educated from the wrong standard to the right standard. But his conscience is going to continue to work on the basis of the standard of right and wrong that he has. So Christianity educates people. The Lord's church is primarily a teaching institution. What does it teach? The gospel. Paul said to the Ephesian elders, I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. So I know it can be done. Paul did it. And I know I can learn it. And God expects me to live by it. For all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. What more could you want as a standard of right and wrong than that? So we're taught to study Show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. James said, Whosoever continueth in the perfect law of liberty, or whosoever hears it and continues in it, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the deed, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Well, what about the person that knows what's right but won't do it? Well, if his conscience works right, he's going to say, feel very bad about that. And thus, when those devout religious Jews gathered to observe the law of Moses on the day of Pentecost, heard the message, Peter said, you have taken with wicked hands, have crucified and slain the Son of God. He offered them proof, besides the miracles that were being done, which was from heaven, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and they cried unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And they were told, as believers, for faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. That they had heard, and they cried out unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter spoke up and said, as believers, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Well, didn't Jesus say, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That he did, Mark 16, 6, 15 and 16. And that's what they did when the time came to do it. Now, what was pricked? Wasn't the blood pump. It was the Edward band that we've been discussing and the four component parts. They heard the message it got in the processor, and they intellectually evaluated the facts of the gospel. They understood that it proved that Christ was the Son of God. And they, in thinking so, arrived at a conclusion that they were wrong and in sin and in need of salvation. The very Messiah they had looked for, they had actually killed, and it hurt them. It hurt them at their heart. Their conscience was pricked. And then by their wills, they turned to ask the question, and by their wills, 
they received with meekness the engrafted word which was able to save their soul and they complied with the commandment of the apostle and they repented and were baptized for the remission of sins. That's the simple old story of the gospel of Christ that so few who name his name do not believe nor understand. They don't even in fact understand the very inward man that God created that is the real them. So a complete change is needed. We've seen that the human heart embraces the intellect, emotions, will, and conscience. So if the heart is to be changed, then the intellect, emotions, will, and conscience must be changed. Remember, it was Paul who said to the Romans, reminding them of what they did in becoming Christians. That God be thanked that you were, past tense used to be no longer, that you were the servants of sin. Servant there is doulos in the Greek. It means a slave. But you've obeyed from what? You've obeyed from the heart. Well, what was obeyed? <coughs> or what parts of the heart were obeyed? All of them. Intellect, emotions, conscience, and will were all involved in their obedience. You obey from the heart. The whole heart must obey in order for there to be conversion from a person of the world lost in sin to one who is a child of God. Sins are remitted when they were baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. For in his death he shed his blood. And as we studied recently, we must reach his blood. So when you read the first part of Romans 6, you will see that when they obeyed that form of doctrine, they obeyed the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. They were baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27. And when they were buried with him in baptism, Romans 6, 3 and 4, Colossians 2.12. It's in his death that they contacted the blood of Christ, for in his death he shed his blood. Thus they obeyed a form of doctrine. And they rose from that watery grave of baptism, new creatures in Christ. In the mind of God they were forgiven, for they had complied with the will of God. Thus, the Hebrews writer could clearly say in no uncertain terms that he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So how is the human heart changed? Well, we've already seen that it involves evidence. A lot of people don't connect evidence at all with Christianity. It's just simply an emotional thing. They reach some sort of high emotional state and they say they've had a great spiritual experience. They haven't anything else. They can get high on a number of things. Some of them that are contrary to the law. <laughs> but you can get high on a number of things. It's more than just your emotions. Because your heart's more than your emotions. Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as wool. What is the idea? You have that which is to be reasoned with. It's in your intellect. God does not expect you to follow him blindly. He gives you evidence that he exists, that Christ is deity, that the Bible is the word of God, and the gospel is the truth concerning salvation. Notice how Christ did when it came appealing to the intellect of man with facts in John 20, 24 through 29. Reach hither thy finger, he said to Thomas. And see my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and put it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Now, what was the impact upon Thomas? Very simple one, but what a magnificent statement. My Lord and my God. On the basis of what? The evidence offered into the intellect rationally thinking with it, concluding the only thing that could be concluded, that this proves he's raised from the dead. And he is the Jesus that I knew before his death and the one that went into the tomb. But here he stands before me. What can I say but my Lord and my God? And it's highly interesting that among all those that are unbelievers on this earth, that the Bible says when the Lord comes back, every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess to the glory of God the Father. The evidence has been here all along. Far better to use it honestly and obey him now than to confess him then 
when it's too late. But the intellect's involved. That's how a person's taught. You go to school somewhere, you take classes on whatever subject it might be, you have to study. Well, God made man as man is, and God reveals himself to man in words, signs of ideas, vehicles of thought. And we study those words to know the mind of God. So whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks unto God the Father by him, Colossians 3.17. You don't know anything about the authority of Christ except you read what he authorizes in his last will and testament, the New Testament of the Bible. And Jesus said, he that receiveth uh, uh, my words, or he doesn't receive my words, and he hath one that judges him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day, John 12, verse 48. So we need to know then that we reason, we hear the words, we understand the words, we study, we meditate on them, we draw conclusions, and we act upon them. Thus, Paul would say in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. When an atheist stands up who says, I know God does not exist and I can prove it, then I'm going to give him a chance to prove it. And I'll say the same thing about the existence of God. I know that God exists and I can prove it. So I'm not afraid of those kind of people. And you'll find that there are a great many people who do a lot of talking but have a little conviction. There are a few of them that do. They like to talk but they don't like to be tested. But now that's the intellect. There's the emotions, and those emotions are changed by faith, but faith is formed in a person by his understanding of the facts presented in the scriptures in the word of God. It's testimony believed that produces a change in emotions. You remember when the Ethiopian eunuch was converted, the scripture says after his baptism, he went on his way rejoicing. A display of emotions mentally or physically or both. He was happy because he knew in his mind that he had done what God required of him when he was baptized. He had believed in Christ on the basis of the preaching of the evangelist Philip. He had repented of his sins, confessed his faith in Christ. And when he saw the water, he said, See, what doth hinder me from being baptized? And he said, I believe with all thine heart thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And they stopped the chariot, and they went down to the water. Philip baptized him. They came up out of the water. The Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and that he saw him no more. And the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. But it's all based in, I know what I did. I know what the truth is. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Jesus said, Father, sanctify them. Set them apart. Make them what they ought to be to serve me. Set them apart by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Thus Paul would say, preach the word because you're preaching the truth. And the word is a seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. So if you want the kingdom of Christ to be on earth, you have to sow the seed. You have to teach the truth. So we see then that our emotions are changed when our faith has been produced by the Word of God and we can rejoice over having done what the Bible required of us. So the will is changed by motives that are produced by faith. Now you'll remember that when you look at uh, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, that if you just follow the process, he wasn't appeared to by Christ to convert him. He was appeared to by the resurrected Christ to make him an apostle of Christ. He could testify by his own eyes that I have seen the risen Lord. And so he did. He was endowed with the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit to be able to confirm the word with signs following. He had those miracles all all of them listed, all nine of them. In 1 Corinthians 12, plus one, he as the other apostles could do, could lay hands on others and impart miraculous gifts unto them. All that took place in the infant state of the church because there was no fully completed revelation of God. It had not been fully written down. They couldn't have opened up a Bible and studied it as far as the New Testament was concerned if they had to. Well, how are they to live the Christian life? Well, inspiration was in man the apostles of Christ. And it's said of the early church, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread. 
Well, how did they do that? They listened to the words of the apostles because Christ, by the Spirit, was speaking through the apostles. But in time, it was set down in the book, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, the last will and testament of Jesus Christ, the New Testament, the 27 books of your Bible, the last 27 books. Thus, when you see the truth presented to Saul of Tarsus, the gospel was not put to him by a divine being, but the Lord had selected Ananias, a gospel preacher, and said, you go over here and you'll find that man and then you teach him. He got there and he found a man already believing in Christ, obvious by his fasting. He was blind, you know, three days and three nights. And he said, now, once he finds out his state, why tarryest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. He called on the name of the Lord when he obeyed the Lord. He was already a believer, obvious by his actions he had repented. He was already by complying with the Lord's will to go to the place where he told him he would hear the rest of the story. He went there and he heard it and he was baptized for the remission of sins. He will to do those things. God does not take our free will away from us. He expects us out of an honest and good heart, Luke 8, 15, to exercise our free will, to act upon the truth we've learned that pricked our conscience, and to obey the truth. What a thought that is. So Saul's sins were washed away in the very act of obedience, an exercise of the will to submit to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one becomes free from sin and a servant of righteousness by obeying from the heart. We're back where we started. You were servants of sin, but you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you being then. When was the then? When was the then? You obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you being then made free from sin. Ye became, there's a conversion, what you once were, what you've turned into. You went down into the water a dead sinner having repented and resolved in your mind to turn away from all acts contrary to God's will. You came up out of the water a new creature. Your sins forgiven, added to the church by the Lord, Acts 2 verse 47, in Christ where he has located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, forgiveness of sins being one of them, Ephesians 1 and verse 3. So the conscience is changed by faith and having done right. You can now, like the Ethiopian eunuch, knowing you've obeyed the proper standard of right and wrong concerning forgiveness of sins, go on your way rejoicing. And that's why we rejoice with people when they're baptized. Christ knows their heart. He knows what they've done, whether they did it from the heart, where all component parts of the heart were involved. So we see then that the Lord adds to the church, since he knows our hearts. And once they're in the church, then they live righteous lives. They are slaves to the truth by their own free will because Christ is the only way to heaven. Remember, Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14 and verse 6. But he also said, if you love me, ye will keep my commandments. John 14, 15. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. The problem of a great many people is they don't know their Bible. They won't do what's necessary to learn it, or else when they hear it, they just don't believe what it says. But you'll never be a Christian except that there's a change of your heart, and you'll never be converted to Christ except that your heart changes. The only thing that can do it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're subject to that gospel, we invite you this morning to obey the simple, pure gospel of Christ, rise from the watery grave of baptism of a Christian, not some hyphenated Christian, just a Christian, which means of Christ. One like you read of in the New Testament. A member of the church Jesus built, and there serve him faithfully till time is no more for you. Someday heaven will be your home. As a child of God, if you have gone back into sin in some way, we urge you to obey God's second law of pardon by repenting of those sins, confessing them, and we'll pray with you and for you that they be forgiven. And now the invitation is yours. While together we stand and sing.